Hey y'all, it's your boy Rico and Sam, and today we are discussing dysphoria. <laughs> uh, so, we wanted to do a video on dysphoria um, because it's something that we, almost all of us struggle with and we know that it's an important topic. I see a lot of younger T-boys on Facebook asking like, how do I deal with this? Like, my dysphoria is so bad, I don't know how to deal with this situation, and um, we wanted to try to give our insight, I guess. Um, there's lots of different kinds of dysphoria, and not everybody will experience the same types, um, but for the most part, the main ones are obviously like chest dysphoria, bottom dysphoria, uh, with dysphoria with your voice, dysphoria with your height, um, dysphoria with like lack of facial hair, anything that basically makes you feel like you don't pass as a cis male uh, can cause dysphoria. Um, personally, I only really struggle with chest dysphoria. I am a larger chested guy, and so it's always been a struggle for me to hide my chest as well as I wanted to. Um, I also struggle with bottom dysphoria, but only when I'm surrounded by cis men in their underwear, which doesn't really happen all the <laughs> um, or... You know, just like in the bedroom, like during sex or, you know, just when I'm with my partner. Um, but other than that, that's not really a huge issue for me. I guess this, the chest dysphoria is my biggest one. What about you? Um, I only get chest dysphoria, of course, when I'm not binding, really. Um, but I'm pretty much alone when I'm not binding. Um, sometimes... I, if I'm not binding and I'm around someone, like a partner, I definitely sucks. I definitely contort my body, like, inwards. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if you've ever done that. But, yeah, like, like so kind of like a kid. Back. Yeah, because, like, usually I, like, sit normal, you know, but, like, I just don't want anything poking out, you know what I mean? So, for some reason, I'm not binding. I try to do that or uh, pile on a hoodie or, I don't know, just, yeah. And um, I also get dysphoria sometimes when I'm not packing. Um, my friends, a lot of my friends are, like, super touchy, and that's totally cool. But um, sometimes it's not totally cool because uh, a lot of them, a lot of the time, want to feel my package, which is, I guess, cool when I'm packing sometimes. But there's been times where they reach for it and I'm not packing. And all of a sudden, like, I freak out inside of my head. I get super hot. I'm just like... Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. So, uh, that definitely sucks, and, uh, it's definitely not a, uh, I don't advise anyone to just randomly touch on a trans per person, even if, no matter how close you are with them, because you never know how they're feeling that day or what's going on, you know? Yeah. And, um, let's see, uh, when I'm swimming, sometimes I get dysphoria. Actually, yeah, all the time, because, uh, I wear board shorts, you know, kind of like the length up to like where my knees are, and I just rock a binder, but it's still something on my chest, you know what I mean? I feel like I'm uh, swimming in like a sports bra, so that that messes me up a little bit. And, uh, and of course, during sex sometimes I get dysphoria, if I... A lot of the times, you know, in the bedroom, I am comparing my body to a cis male, and that, that's just when I get all in my own head, and it messes it up for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess the way that I personally deal with my dysphoria, uh, like I said, I, I mostly struggle with just chest dysphoria, is I focus a lot more nowadays on what I wear. Um, before coming out as trans, I wore a lot tighter fitting clothing. Um, I didn't necessarily care like what colors I wore, and I didn't really know that it would be something I had to pay a lot more attention to once I came out as trans. Um, I know that a lot of people have brought up like I, I'm 
really big chested and like binding's not really an option for me or it doesn't look right when I bind and I feel the same way. Um, a lot of times I struggle like thinking like my chest just doesn't look flat, it just looks like I have uniboob or like I am just wearing a sports bra, like there's just still too just much there. And so the main way that I've figured out to fix that is I wear a lot of dark colors. So I only wear like dark grays or dark blues or black. Um, anything that's darker. Um, I also pay attention to what kind of shirt I wear. So I generally will only wear like cotton shirts. I won't wear the tri blends because the tri blends are gonna be more uh, sticky. So they're gonna like hug your curves a little bit more. So if you wear cotton, it's gonna like be like straight and not stick to you. So that's always been that's been like really helpful information for me. Um, I also generally wear a size bigger now. So I'm pretty short. But I am, I do have dad bod, basically, <laughs> so um, I typically wear like a large, whereas I could probably be a medium, um, and mostly I do that because if you have noticed when you buy, it has like a concave like here, and here, and like maybe in here somewhere, and basically like it, it hugs that area, so it makes it still look like you kind of have a chest, but if you wear darker colors, it's harder to see those, where that the caves in. Um, whereas if you wear like lighter colors like light grays or whites or something, those areas actually show more from my experience. So I, I noticed that I only wear dark colors and I wear completely cotton shirts and that always seems to hide my chest like way better for me. Um, if I want to wear tank tops then I just take like a t-shirt and I'll just cut off the sleeves and I'll just wear it like that. That way my binder shafts are still hidden and it actually, when you cut off the sleeves, it makes it looser here so your chest shows even less, which is great. So you can still wear tank tops in the summertime when it's really hot, but it still covers up everything and it still hides everything the way you need it to, which is awesome. Definitely been a lifesaver for me living in Texas. Um, and yeah, like if you get like a black binder and a black t-shirt, I mean it matches so it's great. Nobody really questions it. Um, as far as like bottom dysphoria in the bedroom, I mean, I think it's all about t communication with your partner on like what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. So like, it's okay when they touch me like this, but it's not okay when they touch me like that. And just making sure that there's clear, clear communication on what you do feel comfortable with if you are going to be like nude in the bedroom. I personally am never fully nude in the bedroom. Um, generally, I will at least wear a binder, typically a full binder, just because it. To me, it looks more appealing when it just looks like I'm wearing a tank top rather than just like a half binder that looks like a sports bra. And it, like to me, um, or if I am wearing a half binder, I'll just throw on a shirt. Uh, but some people are comfortable just wearing like a half binder in bed, and it doesn't bother them, and that's cool too. Um, I think that something out that is also really important as far as like just wearing the bedroom goes is making sure that you have safe words. So. Making sure that your partner knows, like, if you say this word, that means you're a dysphoric and they have to stop now. But you don't have to be like, oh, no, 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 stop, and, like, completely, like, kill the moment. You can just, like, say a word and they can just, like, stop what they're doing and, like, switch it up. And, like, that way you can, it's still organic, it's still flowing, you know what I mean? It's not going to, like, ruin anything. Yeah. So safe words are always great. Um, consent's always great. Uh, making sure that your, your partner knows that they they should talk to you about things before trying something new in case that they were to trigger you or trigger your dysphoria. Um, I know some other people mentioned that they have height dysphoria and as people that are 5'3", um, it's definitely something that we've thought about. Um, like Just the fact that most cis males are taller than us, but People also have to remember there are a lot of cis men that are under 5'3". There are a lot of cis men that are under 5 foot. Yep. Uh, people are just going to be short. And the best way that I've been able to help myself with that is anytime people are looking at me funny because I'm short, I just crack a joke about it. Um, all of my uncles are over 6 foot. And my dad's like at least 5'11", and my mom is even 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, and so I've always just like joked that I got the short end of the stick, that, you know, I drink too much Red Bull as a kid, or I drink too much coffee as a kid, or whatever they say that like stunts your growth as a kid, I just play off of that, I'm just like, yeah, I should have been drinking Red Bull, because now I'm short forever, and <laughs> now your six-year-old's gonna be taller than me by next year, you know, as long as you just like, 
cracking jokes. People aren't going to question you. They're just going to be like, oh, well, obviously he's confident in what he's saying, so yeah. this must be the case. And I've noticed that, that works for me every single time. I've never had anybody question me after that. I've never had anybody say anything against me about that, so that's awesome. Um, I think that other ways that you can deal with height dysphoria, um, it's not something that I've personally done, but I noticed a lot of guys do it too. And that's basically like just wearing like boots. Um, so cowboy boots, hiking boots, anything with like a little couple extra inches in the back, uh, even like maybe like some basketball shoes or something like that. Something that just gives you a little boost. I know that they also make sole inserts that can give you an extra inch or so. And so if your height dysphoria is really bothering you that much, maybe look into something like that, just something that can give you an extra couple inches just to make you like average height or whatever. I don't really struggle with voice dysphoria, uh, voice dysphoria as much uh, since my voice has dropped. Um, I feel like for the most part, I pass as at least like a gay male. Still and male. I'm still male, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I don't really care if people think I'm gay. They get kind of confused when I tell them I'm married to a woman, which is <laughs> funny. I always think it's hilarious when they totally think like, because I'm, I'm pretty feminine sometimes, and they think that I'm totally like this gay guy, but then I tell them I'm married to a girl, and they have no idea what to think. Um, I think that the if I'm worried about passing, like even as a gay male, I'll just like pay attention to word patterns and... Um, I've noticed that just talking like I don't give a shit about anything really helps. Yeah. Like, talking without any emotion. Just being, like, instead of, like, hi, how are you today? Just being, like, hey, what's up? How are you? Like, if you, like, talk like you just don't care, <laughs> your voice typically stays lower. Like, I know that it's yeah. harder for people that are, like, servers or work in the service industry or work in customer service. They typically want to go higher because that's their, like, professional voice. Yeah. But there's still a way to be attentive and take care of customers or take care of people without having to elevate your voice. Um, so you don't sound like an asshole, but you don't have to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. So that's definitely the way that I would do that. Just try to talk as monotone as possible. Yeah, more, more of this, less the fluctuation. Yeah, no fluctuation. Oh, no, and cis males typically don't fluctuate in their voice. They always talk at one tone. So just trying to like make sure that you talk in that same tone all the time. Um, Patterns to like um, men are typically like to the point. They don't just like ramble on about things. So, like make your conversations short and sweet with customers you're never gonna talk to you again, and that's mm -hmm. great. That's a good way to do that. What about you? What do you? How do you handle your dysphoria? Um, other than the obvious binding, packing, um, it would just be that leaves it to the bedroom. Uh, just communication with your partner. Um, letting them know that you are feeling dysphoric because no one can read your mind. It's very important to express it. I know it's hard, but you can even say it in a safe word, you know, if your safe word is red, you know, they're going to know oh, something's going on and that something needs to stop and there needs to be discussion if that trans person is able to vocalize their feelings. Um, Cause I know a lot of the times when I get dysphoric in the bedroom, I shut off completely. I can't, nothing could come out of my mouth. I feel like I'm leaving my body, and it's just like, I don't know, I feel like paralyzed in a sense. And it kind of like, yeah, I feel frozen up. So I try my best to eventually get the point across that I'm feeling dysphoric, something happened. And uh, yeah, just let them know, no one can read your mind. Uh, it's important to let them know what it is so it doesn't happen again. And for them to understand, you know, Yesterday, you can be perfectly fine with that one thing, but you know, today, it triggered you, and that's, that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, your partner should be understanding that you are a trans person. Uh, they knew that going into the relationship, or they figured out that during the relationship, and if they're still with you, then that means that they have to be willing to work with you. Yes. Um, and understand that you're still learning your body just as much as you they are, and that you're still learning what's okay just as much as they are. It's just a learning experience, um, and so communication is definitely, definitely really important. Um, like I said, safe words, too. Um, you can just pick a word, so you don't have to, like, sit there and, like, freak out about it for a while or, like, have some anxiety about it. Like, if you just, like, say one word real quickly, then it, it stops, and you stop feeling this work, and you guys can just work through that. Um, it's definitely the best way to go about it, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that... Another important thing with dysphoria is just making sure you're getting enough self-care. Um, so making sure you're taking time for yourself just to like relax and not worry about 
having to pass and making sure you have like plenty of time to yourself at home where you don't have to worry about passing, where you don't have to worry about binding because as, as you know, it is very important not to bind for more than eight hours a day. So like making sure you're having time where you can take off your binder, just wear a hoodie if that helps you or just yeah. chill out and not have to stress about how other people are perceiving you. And that's great. Um, Self-care is definitely very important for a trans person to make sure that they're giving themselves. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's it for episode D for dysphoria. Um, next week we're going to be uh, covering endocrinologists, and that's your tea doctor. So we're going to talk about um, what it's like to go through your first tea, point, tea appointments, or just like what it's like going to tea appointments after, even after the first one. Like what you should expect, um, what you need for something like that, uh, what they kind of cover, what they kind of talk to you about, just so you guys know what to expect if you haven't already started tea and don't already know what might happen when you go to your first tea appointment. Uh, we thought you, we might give you some insight on that. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, like it, comment, share, you know what to do. We'll see y'all next time. Bye. <laughs>